All right, we got a lot to cover this week in Linux. There's been a lot of project updates today, so I'm going to get straight into the news as GNOME 48 introduces new group notifications based on an app or what they call a thread. It's been developed for a better part of a year now and will be included in the GNOME 48 release. This is the first step of implementing grouping of notifications by app. This does not consider threading of conversations at the moment, but what does that look like? Well, here's a preview in the notifications. We can see that applications that are similar, for example, we have Flare here, all get comprised together in one grouping and you can expand it. It's kind of cool. And you can also expand a thread. This is currently not implemented, but will be in the future. Key little enhancements to the GNOME user experience and keeping consistency across the GNOME desktop environment. Definitely looking forward to this overhaul of the notifications. It's a small change, but I'm excited for it personally. That way I don't get a clutter of notifications. Speaking about desktop changes, the KDE Plasma 6.3 is officially out and available now. It brings major enhancements, including improved fractional scaling, especially if you're using the zoom feature, better color accuracy, and some CPU optimizations on a few of their applications. I go much more into depth about this one in another video. If you wanna check that one out after Going through the news today, I'd be glad to show you all the new improvements as KDE 6.3 is clearly a greatly polished desktop and, and continues to push itself towards the top of the best Linux desktop environments. And speaking on KDE, moving KDE's styling into the future, there's a new project called Union, which aims to unify the fragmented ways that KDE apps are styled. A lot of the community says that there's an issue with how KDE is styled, and this is a way that they're going to try and address it. Last year during the Academy, I gave a talk at the Union called The Future of Styling in KDE. In this talk, I presented a problem. We currently have four ways of styling our applications. Not only that, but some of the approaches are quite hard to work with, especially for designers who lack programming skills. This all leads to being incredibly hard to make changes to our application styling currently, which is not only a problem for something like the Plasma Next initiative, but even smaller changes take a lot of effort. And a lot of us have experienced this inconsistency in the KDE user interface, but introducing Union hopefully will greatly improve KDE's UI, making it more consistent which again, a lot of people talk about being a major issue with KDE. And I'm all about this project as it tries to aim towards making the KDE experience more cohesive by unifying the fragmented styling approaches into one system, hopefully it addresses the current problem. And instead of focusing on forcing all KDE apps to go through the same rendering code, Union will create a structured styling system with three layers, an input layer, intermediate layer, and an output layer which the input layer is going to read and interpret styles from various sources, think SVG files or CSS in the future. Then the intermediate layer translates the input into a common structured format, which we all need to make things look similar. And finally, the output layer will then convert it to a format that actually does rendering, commands specific to different technologies like Qt Quick, Qt Widgets, so on and so forth to actually render whatever input was made. They're currently working on the intermediate section as of major focus is going to have to be on that section. And they say that the initial testing results are promising. I'm all for it. As KD unifies its desktop, we also receive a new DRM panic with BSOD or the blue screen of death. And we'll know it as the black screen of death on Linux. At least that's what the renders currently show when the panic gets generated. DRM refers to direct rendering management. And we're talking about a panic whenever the DRM, which interfaces with GPUs, managing graphics memory, and handling rendering operations crashes. We now receive the first pull request from the DRM miscellaneous next for what will become Linux version 6.15. And the panic screen's QR code now implements FIDO 2.2 standard, leading to improved QR debugging. I've been following along, watching updates getting made to the BSOD on Linux, and I'm very excited for this because the more and more we focus on this, the more user-friendly kernel crashes become. Instead of cryptic crash logs that you have to sift through, the DRM panic with the BSOD makes it a lot easier to diagnose system failures for desktop users and developers alike. Anyways, I'm all for it. I love to see updates to the panic screen. Now here's a wild one. We're talking about changing the default timers in Linux. 
The frequency at which tick happens is very important from the scheduler perspective. There's a responsiveness trade-off that for interactive systems, the current default is set to low. Having a slow tick frequency can lead to the following shortcomings in scheduler decisions. Imprecise time slices, delayed load balance calls, which can easily become stale as more tasks wake up, delayed stat updates, and so on and so forth. So the idea here is a Google engineer has proposed raising the Linux kernel's default timer frequency from 250 hertz to 1000 hertz, hopefully to improve the scheduler precision, responsiveness, and performance, but just simply changing out the timer frequency for the Linux kernel isn't all just optimization. Here's the simple code change suggested by the maintainer. Prompt timer frequency, the default is currently 250 hertz. They'll change it to 1000 hertz and implement the default. It is customary to have the timer interrupt run at 1000 hertz. Anyways, this can increase CPU overhead. A higher tick rate means that the system guarantees four times as much interrupts compared to the default increasing CPU overhead as the kernel has to process more interrupts. So will that reduce efficiency? We'll have to see. Also, another thing that I can think of is higher power consumption. Increased timer interrupts can prevent the CPU from entering deeper power saving states. Scheduling overhead might be an issue where we have to handle more context switches. So while raising the timer frequency to 1000 Hertz might enhance the responsiveness, it can come at a cost of higher CPU usage and power consumption. We'll see how this one plays out and if it gets accepted, but currently this is a proposed change and is significant to the Linux kernel. And before moving on to the next topic, take a moment, smash that like button for me so we can get more people to enjoy this news. Also think about subscribing below. YouTube can get a little finicky and doesn't necessarily give you updates on new videos. Unless you're subscribed, you wouldn't wanna miss the next one. And since we're speaking about the kernel here, Ubuntu made an oopsie and has delayed their release. Noble 24.04.2 is delayed by a week. Why? Well, there was an unfortunate incident. It appears that some 24.04.2 images built this week did not include the HWE kernel, which stands for hardware enablement and is crucial for updated hardware support. The developers now have to respin the affected images and ensure that all flavors of the 6.11 kernel are built in. While it's a minor delay, it will cause the new release to get scheduled for the 20th of February, 2025. They also mentioned that we will also make sure to do proper retrospective to prevent this from happening in the future. Thank you on behalf of the release team. A bit of a blunder by the release team over at Ubuntu. As you would think, this would be basically on a checklist at this point. The big deal here is if the HWE kernel wasn't included, backported improvements from, let's say, Ubuntu 24.10, which enhanced compatibility with newer hardware, including CPU, GPUs, and peripherals, would not be included. So it makes a lot of sense why they're delaying this by a week. Either way, you'll have a new version of Ubuntu coming to you very soon. Get ready to make an update. Something that people are excited for and has been in the works for around five years now is the adding of a color management protocol and HDR protocol into Wayland, which is going to in turn allow applications to understand the display color properties and output of HDR content correctly. There has been a lot of work on this one and we see here Sebastian is saying that they finally think it's ready for merging and after a lot of thread work on the staging of add color management protocol. The aim here is again, color management extension to allow clients to know their color properties of outputs and tell the compositor about the color properties of their content on surfaces. Of course, this is essential to modern displays. HDR support and precise color management are critical for professional graphics work, things like gaming or media playback. Wayland has definitely made long-standing improvements and is helping boost Linux desktop adoption with things like better HDR support and color management. They can start finally competing against things like Windows and Mac OS when it comes to high-end display fidelity. This is a great and huge step forward, in my opinion, for Linux graphics. Just know we're one step closer to this merge that started over five years ago. FLAC 1.5 finally introduces multi-threaded encoding, significantly improving encoding speeds by utilizing multiple CPU cores. Now you can actually set, like most applications, that use multi-threading with the dash J flag, giving you the number of cores or threads you wanna use, which FLAC stands for Free Lossless Audio Codec. It's an open source lossless audio compression format that preserves the original quality of audio while reducing its file size. And unlike MP3 and AAC, which discard some audio data to achieve compression, FLAC retains all the original sound data. It's great for audio files, music, 
archives and professional audio workflows. Regardless, this significant update for Linux users who use lossless audio formats will be very happy as it's going to reduce the time and speed up the process for encoding. Definitely another exciting update coming to Linux. Love to see all the new updates to open source projects. Now we're gonna talk about System D. It's getting the ability to boot directly into a disk image downloaded via the web or HTTP during the Linux boot process. Lenart here posts about a fun little thing I've been working on, teach systemd to boot directly into a disk image downloaded via HTTP with InnetRD, which in the systemd project, this would extend the systemd import generator to not only download a disk image at boot, but also attach it to a loopback device so that we can boot from it. What's cool about this is this is a major step towards a network-based Linux boot system, which will help benefit developers, system admins, and especially cloud environments. This makes it easier for people to test new system images remotely without manually having to flash the disk. We all know how much of a pain it is if you're using something like vSphere, for example, and you want to attach a new ISO or system image to install. You gotta go a bit through the hardware settings and set up for the boot process in order to get things actually running. This would make life a lot easier, and I'm very excited to see the System D team working on this. For those of you who know the pain, let me know in the comment section below if you're excited for something like this. And now I wanna get into some more concerning news. Well, at least for me, artificial intelligence AI introducing Intel's new NLP model called PoliteGuard. Just by the name, it sounds a little goofy, and I kinda think it is. The idea here is AI moderation, customer service, and open natural language processing research to take place on Linux. This is a new open source NLP model designed to classify text politeness using the BERT based text classification model. For those of you who don't know, it's just a model that already exists. You can get it on Hugging Face, for example. But the idea here is to modify that model so it categorizes text between polite, somewhat polite, neutral, or impolite. And the reason I think this is a little goofy is the subjectivity that comes with this. Politeness is a highly subjective and culturally dependent topic. In one region, something can be seen as polite in another region and might be impolite. Who is gonna enforce this politeness bias or policy? It just seems strange that and we're expecting a neural network to do it. And where do we plan on implementing things like this? I mean, that alone is a little weird in my opinion. The other thing too is what type of data are they actually training this on? Is it also synthetic data based on other models, meaning it may lack the real world linguistic nuance and just generalize natural conversations? Just doesn't seem like a critical problem we're trying to solve here. Politeness classification seems like a niche problem compared to other natural language processing challenges like factual accuracy. What about bias? Or even understanding multilingual conversation? This just feels like a PR-driven AI project that lacks significance or real-world impact, at least in my opinion. Let me know what you think about this whole thing in the comment section below. But anyways, we're getting Intel's new NLP model, Polite Guard letting us know who's being polite and who's being impolite. Regardless of what Intel's push is, we're going to get into one of the main pieces of news that has overtaken Linux in the last couple weeks. A Linux maintainer, Hector, had stepped down as the Apple Silicon Linux kernel maintainer for the upstream due to their disputes on and over the Rust integration into the kernel. I have a whole video on that, going through the entire conversation of Hector and some of the other maintainers, including Linus and how they stepped in with Hector ultimately stepping down. I'm going to post a link in the description below to check that one out. That video is very long and goes more into the nuance and conversations that were had. But regardless, keeping in the mind that Hector stepped down, we actually have some good news. Sven and Jenny have stepped up and agreed to share the maintainership for the ARM Apple platform after the recent step down, I'm handling the downstream of Acai Linux tree since April 2024 and worked on or wrote several drivers for the platform. I'm happy to see that someone is stepping up for a continued development and mainline kernel integration with Acai Linux and the Apple Silicon drivers, which is going to ensure that Apple Silicon Linux progresses by upstreaming Apple Silicon support into the Linux kernel and will help expand the ARM Linux growth ultimately as a lot of new hardware is going towards ARM. We definitely benefit from this resolve. It's too bad that Hector had to step down. I completely understand and wish everyone the best. Even though things got heated, it's good to prioritize your efforts and leave a project whenever you think it's necessary. Well, I'm going to end it on that good news. Did you enjoy this Linux news today? If you did, smash that like button for me. I'd really appreciate it. Thanks for getting to the end of the video. You're a true supporter. Make sure to subscribe below if you haven't already. You're clearly enjoying the videos. Catch me in a great community on Discord, and I'll catch you in another video. Thanks for watching.
Linux can be hard to understand, but I take the most commonly used terms, commands, and subjects in Linux and I break them down into simple to read documents, including Linux terms, flashcards, a checklist, a cheat sheet, and a mind map. And if you're ready to level up your Linux experience and knowledge, go to SavvyNick.com now and get access to these sheets.